collision last week did, uh, uh, as we talked about, did lower ratings than the, obviously, the debut week. We had mentioned when we talked about the debut episode, okay, it started at, I think the average was 800,000. Let's see where it's going to go. It's obviously going to go down because generally the debut is the big deal. But how far and, and what will the ratings pattern be? So this is a week old. But before we talk about collision on July 1st, what was last week's ratings? And the thing I'm interested in is, did they keep a bigger percentage of the audience they started with than Wednesday night does? Because I think we established Wednesday night lost a little over 25% of their starting audience this past week. Well, these are the ratings for AEW Collision June 24th, 2023 on TNT, compiled by WrestleNomics. The overall number, on average, 595,000 viewers. Yeah, so uh, down a little bit over 200,000. Oh, where uh, You know, instead of going through this in granular detail, it is a week old. What was... What was, where, where'd they start? What was the top of the 9 o'clock hour, and where'd they finish? They started 8 o'clock, 8 to 8.15 p.m. with uh, the opening promos from everyone, and then going from that into the Chris Jericho, Minoru Suzuki, Naito segment, Ooh. and then Miro's promo. 605,000 viewers. 605. 605. Trademark. Damn right it is. So where were they at the top of 9 o'clock? Nine o'clock hour, which was a video for the Owen Hart tournament video. Well, a video for the video. A vi an Owen Hart tournament <laughs> video as and, well. And several people. As well as Nyla Rose versus Willow Nightingale with picture in picture, 592,000 viewers. So they lost 13,000 people from start through the first hour. Okay. Uh, and just for the records, we discussed it last time. So let's include it this time just for uh, comparison. Open with the key demo, 283. At the 9 o'clock hour, 274. <laughs> and then finally, for the main event, which began at 9.30, quarter 7, 9.30 to 9.45 p.m., which spills into the final quarter with plenty of picture-in-picture, picture, Punk, FTR, and Ricky Starks versus Bullet Club Gold and the Guns. 9.30 to 9.45, 616. 9.45 to 10 p.m., 6.34. And for the key demo, 288 and 289. So, wait a minute. I'm writing down numbers as fat. 288 and 289? For key demo for the last two quarters, correct. So, their two-hour program started with 605,000 people and ended with 634,000 and had picked up to 616 in seg or is not quarter seven. And they also picked up 6,000 people in the key demo from start to finish, so it's not the numbers that Wednesday does, but apparently for people trying to watch this program, there's nothing where they say, I've had enough, I can't take anymore, this is ridiculous, get me the fuck out of here. There was a big drop in the number right before the main event match. It went from 592 to 554, that was the biggest drop of the episode, but then for the main event match, it picked right back up, 616, 660. Or 634. Okay, so even 554 from where they started at 605, that is not even 10% of the uh, 50,000 of 605. It's not even 10% of the audience. At their lowest point, they had lost less than 10% of the audience. I don't know if you would know this offhand, and it's not necessarily a perfect equation or perfect comparison, maybe. But for TBS Wrestling on Saturday nights, and we looked at ratings differently then than we do now, but you were someone paying attention to different things. Yeah. Did the audience typically stay to the end of the episode on Saturdays? You know, we did not in those days. I mean, it was done, but we didn't care about the quarter hours. The first time that, especially on Saturday night, to be honest, at 6.05, they were doing numbers. Uh, I remember that time in uh, April of 1990, the Saturday night show did a 4.0 rating of the rating measurement of the time. And Sunday night, the main event show at six o'clock on Sunday did a 4.4. That translated to 
around 3 million homes, but homes then were given a, a particular number of people. They weren't measuring individual viewers. And, and a home at that point was 1.6 viewers. Back in the fucking 60s, a home was like three viewers because people only had one television. So the point is they measured the overall number of people for most of the shows, but then with the Clash of Champions, when they started being a thing in like 88, that's when we first started hearing about quarter hours because as you'll recall, the first Clash of Champions, the highest rated Crockett television program, I think of pretty much of all time on TBS was Flair and Sting and they got up to what was it, a seven point something rating for the main event, it increased over the Clash of Champions. And that was common. The main event would be the highest watched segment of the program by far. And that was opposite WrestleMania. And that was opposite WrestleMania. But also just any time of any of the clashes or, you know, any big shows, the main event, the last 15 minutes or 30 minutes or however long it, that was usually the highest rated part of the program. It was like the uh, same thing as a house show. You start out with the prelims and people filtered in as long as they saw the main event, they were happy. In a sense, I guess you could argue that again, this is just week two. We don't know where the numbers are going to settle at. And this past week's show that we're about to talk about was taped. It's a different energy altogether, but I guess somewhat similar to SmackDown, you know, it starts at a level. It may be a little higher because we want to see who's going to be there at the start, but it peaks at the end because it's the main event, whether it's a yeah. match or a segment. Here, you began at 6.05. Again, it began with those promos, those uh, Saturday night's main event kind of promos with Punk, FTR, and Starks, and then the heels. So you knew Punk was there. People didn't dive off the show. They just kind of wavered around the show, and then for the main event, you got a little bit of a surge. Yeah, and well, also, there's nothing... There was something on this show to run you off, but there's nothing insulting in in theory. Sometimes in execution, this may have not this cake may have not risen all the way, but there was just no 20 minutes of chaos where you said, "Well, I've seen everything I can see," or just completely uninteresting people doing stupid shit or whatever. It's more consistent. It's a it's a wrestling program, and you know that you're going to see some matches, but the big main event's coming up. Plus, the commentary is a big deal. Yes, I think you can actually listen to it. This is not; they're not trying to do the 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 silly show here. They're trying to be serious, and everything didn't land on this, but they're trying to be serious. And I fear, as we'll get into it in a second, that some of the Excesses of the Wednesday night program may hamper their efforts, but we'll see. Um, and like you said, they had the opening brief comments from the participants in a couple of the matches. And the emphasis is on the matches and who's going to win them. And they were brief and serious. And then you get Elton John. And then, unfortunately, this was the Hamilton show and we scoffed about it the holidays. They taped it on Thursday. When we have more time for emails, we'll read a couple, but we've had a number of emails from people that said, oh yeah, first they put Forbidden Door on sale, and then we heard about Dynamite and whatever the fuck else, they, and then they put this on sale. There were literally people still buying tickets at the last minute that were finding out about this thing. <laughs> so their fourth night out of how many, what was it, Friday's... In a week, they've been there four times in Toronto slash Hamilton. I, I forget exactly what nights. So at the United Center, it looked great because there were people there and they could pan the crowd and the building and give it the big feel. Here, the set was gigantic and the crowd shots were so tight, you could check the people for cavities because they couldn't pan. There was no, there was no crowd, Jerry. So that hurt a bit. The announcer mix was better than I've ever heard it, though. I could actually hear the, or maybe it was just because I was listening to the announcers, but it, did they seem clearer to you? I didn't even pick up on that, so I can't say one way or the other. Or maybe it's just the way that they talk. You can understand them. I don't know. I think that's a big part of it. Kevin Kelly 
You know what? He's been doing this a long time. I first saw him in New York on TV from the IWF, the Eddie Mansfield company out of Florida. Yeah. That was like 92. I think now he's actually doing the best work of his career. I think the variety of experiences he's had and the different styles he's had to call yeah. and the different levels of information he's had to disseminate. I think right now he's actually at the best point he's ever been at as a commentator. Well, he had his challenges in the first match because he had to call MJF versus Kip Morst. And here's what they were setting. Obviously, the deal is MJF, the AEW champion, is wrestling on the new show Collision. And, of course, he picked his opponent. And I get the idea of the heel champion picking a tomato can, a pushover. But they went for the visual joke that the guy's anorexic. And to me, that that takes the heat off of it and makes it look amateur and outlaw. If you've got a guy whose name is fucking old Dan Tucker and you've never seen him before and his record in AEW is zero and zero, he can still look somewhat like an athlete just so it doesn't make a joke of the thing and gets the heat that, yes, MJF picked a guy that we've never heard of before. Young wrestler trying to make a name for himself. He accepted this because what choice does he have? But not, look at this guy. He looks like he just went to give blood and forgot to say when. That takes it into funny. I, am I, again, am I too picky? Yes and no. I mean, mostly no, I think. I mean, I get what they were trying to do, and I don't know what options they had. So I also saw the other option that came out on the stage before Ethan Page. But he's came a down. fucking billionaire. There are goddamn legitimate athletes trying to be involved in wrestling. A plane ticket from wherever, somewhere in the middle of the United States to Toronto, four hundred dollars, and give the guy a hundred bucks to be on TV and put him in a hotel. You don't just have to pick up whoever's in the goddamn parking lot with their hand out. Anyway. So MJF, Heat Seeker, and LaBelle Lock, boom, tap out. And then he did the promo where he rips Hamilton and Canada and all the fans did. I, I didn't know Canadians were hillbillies, though. Do they have hills in Canada? Yeah, I was a little surprised when he called the Canadians hillbilly. In Ontario, of all places. a habit, you think? I guess so. If you were going to call any Canadians hillbillies, it would be the people in Ontario? I would think more like Saskatoon or maybe out in Edmonton or somewhere. Anyway, he ripped them and then he challenged, I'll fight anybody from Hamilton. And out comes a fucking fat guy, the second coming of Gino Moore. Right? <laughs> Don't say and, that. That's the worst and, thing you could say about a human being. And But then oh. as he's waddling down the entranceway, here comes Ethan Page, the other Page. We forgot about him. He's still around, and he comes out. And now we find out he's from goddamn Hamilton. So everybody gets a chance in their hometown. And he slapped the microphone out of MJF's hand, and, and he cut a halfway serious promo for once. And he gave his father's biography and local work status to make him sound like the common man from Hamilton and called MJF a bare minimum bitch. And I think and then he, he went, he went a little too far with the Calgary public relations tour story where he has done so much for AEW and his girlfriend asked him, well, why won't they do something for you? And if he'd have just put a period on it, he finally, he got there at the end, but he tried too hard in the middle. Did old Ethan Page, and finally MJF said, okay, I'll, I'll wrestle you. So we had their match. And right at the top of it, uh, I think Nigel's mic went out for a while because there was dead silence. Like, I've, I've been in that position where, like, Kevin's reaching over there trying to help him plug something in or whatever the fuck, or they're talking to the truck. But anyway, um... As you mentioned, it was nice to hear the announcers not having hemorrhages on everything. So they had a serious match, and that's the, the theme of this television program. They're having wrestling matches. They're being serious. They're not doing the cute shit and the nonsensical stuff. And that's why they're, I think, one of the reasons why they're keeping an audience from start to finish, because if you're going to 
dedicate yourself to this show, you know what you're getting. You're getting a wrestling show. And you're interested in seeing them do it because it's different. There was no real break spot in this match. They just kind of went, but it was the best Ethan Page match. Of course, I've paid very little attention to any of his others just because he annoys me. But he had some fire. He made a comeback, hit a power slam, got a two count, hit a twist of fate. It took about five years to get to the top rope, and MGF crotched him. And then, you know, he uh, Page foiled a superplex and hit a power slam off the top for a two count. And then, because he'd had his leg work, worked on, when Page tried the razor's edge, his knee buckled. And MJF hit the dragon screw on a on the bad leg, and then the heat seeker, boom, one, two, three. And he's getting that finish over, so that's good, because MJF has had a shortage of matches where he can win with his finish. And that's what he needs to be doing a little bit more, just for the sake of it. But, uh, I mean, again, I'm not a big Ethan Page fan, but this served to help MJF out. I thought Ethan Page was capable of more than he's been doing for a while, and you and I have always disagreed on it. I thought the match was okay. I thought he went too long on the mic. I'm not a fan of wrestlers in general. The whole, you know, you may be all about you and taking care of you and your family. I care about the company. <laughs> Give me a, you don't even have a union. Stop it. Uh, so I'm not a big fan of that stuff, but uh, he tried to take real world shit and incorporate it in his promo, and it was, I guess, the first overtly babyface promo we've seen from him. We'll see if this was just a one-time thing or if it goes anywhere, but it was an all right match. It was nice to see MJF on the show, I guess. I guess? You're not sure? It was nice to see MJF on this show. All right. Anyway, we're going back to the Owen Hart tournament. And I was interested in seeing this. Dustin Rhodes and Powerhouse Hobbs, again, a veteran in the ring with a younger guy. And that can lead to the younger guy developing and flowering and blossoming and prospering. Except he's got two anchors around his neck. No function Marshall and miscellaneous white girl. And I thought they'd gotten away from that, but apparently maybe QT was just out of town one week. So it, they had a nice match again. Uh, powerhouse got on... Dustin early and Dustin would fight back, but then Hobbs glommed him from behind and posts him and he got some color and we go to the break. And when we came back, Dustin was a bloody mess, but he made a comeback and hit a crossroads. And then did you see, I have never seen anybody do the pile driver like Bobby Eaton used to. And Dustin Rhodes did it. And that's not a compliment <laughs> because, <laughs> well, no, I've said for years and Bobby said it. The one thing that Bobby Eaton could not do is give a pile driver, no matter how hard he tried. And he had a thing. It was a mental thing, whatever. When he'd have the guy up, when he started to sit down, instead of going flat on his ass, he would bend his right leg back underneath him and his left leg would be straight out and the guy'd kind of go down sideways he'd protect him but then and it didn't look good and and he didn't know why he did that and he couldn't not do it and that's why except if it was specifically necessary and called for he never did a pile driver but dustin did the pile driver the exactly same way so i, I don't know but anyway they finally hit another false finish and then QT got up on the apron and Dustin nailed him and then Hobbs squashed Dustin in the corner, hit him with a clothesline and a spine buster, but only got a one count. And then Dustin hit the power slam two count and then Hobbs kicked Dustin into the ropes and that's where QT nailed him. And then Hobbs hit another spine buster, one, two, three, I thought the whole reason for Hobbs versus Dustin was that Hobbs would get a win over a, a name and a, you know, quality level opponent, but it was just with QT's help. But therefore, Hobbs still wins and advances. 
I mean, nice match. Nice to see Dustin out there. If he's going to really be retiring at some point soon, I wish they would do something more with him for whatever time he has left in the ring. Powerhouse Hobbs is being wasted if he's with QT Marshall and whoever this woman they're trying to shove down everyone's throat is. Miscellaneous white girl? QT doesn't work. I mean, it's not just us. It's everyone who's been saying it, and it's been years now at this point, and they still force him on that show for no reason other than the fans don't want to see him. I, I can't explain any other reason. Well, no, the reason is because he's he's a nice guy, and he's helping Tony in the office and carrying papers around, so look at the hometown shit we're seeing. Right? Anytime somebody, if Tony likes you, if you're in your hometown, or, boy, you you really deserve to be on this big show. You know, but anyway, at least they're putting Hobbs over. At least they're putting him over, and, you know, you've been saying it, and I hadn't even noticed. The tournament brackets are set up. It's actually Joe and Punk not in the finals. Well, and I saw that. I misread, apparently, the brackets that I saw on Twitter because it's so very small. But Joe will meet Punk next week, but that's the semifinal. And I, it, this way that gives him so many places to go because I don't, I don't know that Punk has to win. If they have the right finish, Joe could win or Punk could win. And then Joe could cost Punk the tournament against Hobbs, which would then cause Punk and Joe to go off on their own little issue mission and let Hobbs be the tournament winner and do something from that. There's a number of different things they can do. But at least we're going to get Punk and Joe, which is probably the, the best ratings draw for the kind of audience that this show is being aimed for to begin with. The people who want to see a slobber docker, as they say. Hey, they've spent two weeks building it up, but we'll get there. Um, Anthony Henry was back. I didn't know he lived in Toronto. See, they bought a plane ticket for somebody. He couldn't have driven up there from, where is he from? The Carolinas? The workhorsemen, he has to be from the Carolinas. Anyway, Miro got another one-sided squash match, as it should have been. Henry got a flurry, and he did a good job, but then he did a good job. And Miro won with the camel clutch. And then this is where, Brian, you tell me, but I think this is where, according to some emails we got and according to my personal preferences, I think this is where the show took a hit, at least quality-wise and potentially, you know, the momentum. Bullet Club interview Jen and Juice and the Gun Boys with Tony Schiavone, followed by... The Bullet Club's Jay White against Ricky Starks, 30 minutes for this next bit of business to all transpire, and the interview didn't start it off well. No, it did not. And as you said, we got a lot of feedback. Cult of Cornet Facebook group, emails, some tweets, listeners of this show, listeners who have enjoyed a lot of the people we're talking about, and they said that this promo went too long and it killed the room. And the match after it suffered greatly because of that. And that's what we saw play out here. And this was in an edited form. This was after having several days oh, shit. to produce it. That's Do you think they cut anything out of this? I'm not saying they did, but this is them after having a chance to sweeten it or do whatever they had to do to make this Good. more palatable. Well, is it because Jay White has never done television interviews because he's never been on television they don't have interviews in new japan to my awareness they don't have television in any promotion he'd work for in the uk or australia or wherever the fuck he's from in new japan sometimes after a big match you may get on the mic and just start talking to the fans but there's no rush you can kind of take your time and again there's a translation thing and then they do the scrums the press conferences afterwards where a wrestler shows up and breathes heavy and does their promo there he's done well with that is what we've heard from a lot of people and we've seen a little bit of it but this was not the setting for his promo at all well it was it was all of them and they had to go back tony was just standing there through the whole thing because jay white took the microphone and did a promo and it was eh. 
And then the guns come in and they picked it up with some oomph because they've got personality. But after they got finished, then Tony jumps in and tells them that, well, the rest of the Bullet Club's barred from ringside for this match you've got with Starks coming up, Juice. And then Jay White took the microphone back and cut a promo on Punk and wants his belt that's in his goodie bag. And it was meandering and went back and forth. And poor Tony Schiavone sounds 80 years old now, something with his voice. I don't know. Then they started talking about FTR and it just got longer and longer. And Juice didn't talk. The guy was wanting to hear from. That's right. And then when they finished this long promo, then on the screen, Punk and FTR and Starks popped up and Punk responded to them. And FTR talked about the guns. And Starks promo Juice. And it was long. And by then they're at nine o'clock. And Starks and Juice was the nine o'clock hour match. And they had a good wrestling match. It, it was serious. There was no flips and no floor and etc. But the problem was, is it, it was a small crowd who were worn out by the previous segment. And this wasn't a fantastic match. It was a good solid match. And it was a little long too. Because it was almost 15 minutes. And then finally, Starks won it, one, two, three. But then as the heels were going to surround him, FTR and Punk ran out, no music, to even the odds, and the heels bailed out. But a lot of the fans booed the baby faces making the save. <laughs> so it was 30 minutes from the start of the Bullet Club promo to the end of this match, and it was just, it was a while. It took a while. It did, and as much as we've liked Juice Robinson and Jay White, you know, he's been all right, and the guns show a world of potential, they're still being established. They're not established. With the casual fan, with the average viewer, with the person who's not sitting in Hamilton, and they didn't really seem to react well to this, when they're in there with Punk or FTR, it's one thing, but when they're working long matches and people aren't fully invested in them yet... They shouldn't be working long yeah. matches. Yes, I concur. Well, thank you. Speaking of somebody that shouldn't be working matches, is Sean Spears uh, uh, back again? They're trying this again. What is going on with him confronting Christian Cage and the dinosaur? I was conflicted on this. My first thought was, no, you can't do this. <laughs> you have to do something else right now with Christian and Luchasaurus to establish them more as the TNT champions. Sean Spears, we've seen. We've seen the way he's been used. It hasn't worked. Now, I will say, you talk to wrestlers, they put him over big time. He's one of these guys that they all say how great he could be, but he's been used horribly. And I was ready to completely dismiss this, but he got serious at the end of the promo. And it was a different tone than he usually has. And I said, okay, I'm going to see what they do with this. And if he's going to be on collision, there's probably a reason for that. And that reason is probably people there are probably going to bat for him and saying, let's try something different with him here. So for that reason, I'm going to give it a chance and see where they go. But beyond that, I had the same reaction you had. And, and you're right. I mean, we haven't seen him stink the joint out, but it's just he's always in either something that is silly or extraneous or just didn't work or the whole chair thing or whatever the fuck. Well, all right, let's see what happens. And we're happy to know that the TBS title is still fully around the waist of Chris Statlander. She resisted the challenge of Lady Frost, the granddaughter apparently of Tony Marino. I was wondering if you watched a match to hear that when they said that on commentary. I didn't realize that. Amazing. Batman. Batman with two T's. Just in <laughs> case DC Comics ever went through Pittsburgh and happened to notice anything. Because that would stop the lawsuit. Not that he's dressed would. like Batman, but he Not had that an he, extra T. Yeah, nothing about the cape or the cowl <laughs> or the gray and black suit or the utility belt would have stood out, but the, or the, the two T's. The or side the side kick kick. Robin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we got to put Statlander over. 
because at first she was years ago, she was hanging out with the Puddin gang. She was a space alien from the Andromeda galaxy. She fit right in with the fucking circus clown car, but she had those ACL injuries. And now that she's come back, she's in shape. You could, the determination to not just one, but two of those on both, both legs to work out, do the rehab, come back from that. She's, looks in great shape. She's not a space alien anymore. She's serious. Um, so we got, and she won with a tombstone again. I'm not sure the tombstone be the best thing for a young lady with two bad knees, but we will, we'll work with that. But Statlander, I'd like to see her against Rhea Ripley. Another one of those interpromotional dream matches. Give us two matches, Statlander versus Rhea and Butch versus pockets. That's not the second match I would pick as a dream match, I don't think. I want to see Butch beat the ever-loving shit out of pockets. Anyway, um, I liked Andrade's match the other day, but they they should not let him speak on television. Because then it whatever he's saying, most wise asses, and who's watching TV and wrestling on Saturday evenings, smart asses, they're going to laugh at him trying to pronounce words because it's bad. And as he was yelling at the house of black or the house of black, they got came up on the monitor behind him and responded to him in this pre-tape. But, um, yeah, so we got that to look forward to. You know what? I was willing to go with Andrade's promo. He's fired up. He doesn't speak English. As you once put it a long time ago, he may not even be able to speak Spanish. I'm not I, sure. I can't tell. <laughs> I was willing to go with it. And I'm happy they're using Lexi Nair on this show because she's not used really on Dynamite and she's good at what she does and it feels different than Dynamite. Let me just say that. But when the House of Black show up on the monitor, somehow, whatever cameraman they've accosted and forced to film, he got into the control board and they took over this monitor that I don't like. Enough with the spooky House of Black shit. Just be a bunch of weirdos that like tattoos and like hanging out together. You don't have to do any of this spooky shit that no one likes. Maybe they like tattooing each other. There you go. There you go. But you know what it was time for now, don't you, old Brian? Like Mussolini on commentary. That's CM right. Punk is on color commentary for the Owen Hart tournament match between Rowdy Roddy Strong and Samoa Joe. And did you notice Punk may not be that mo that popular in Toronto or a Hamilton or whatever, but the front row loved him. Everybody that could get within range of touching him or getting his autograph, they love him. It's just those cheap people up in the fucking stands that th they don't have enough money to be able to like CM Punk. Anyway, um, you know, how can I say I didn't like Roderick Strong and Samoa Joe? Because that was the reason why that I was involved with and interested in the Ring of Honor style. This is what, and these guys, and of course now they're the previous generation, but they were the generation of guys that showed what modern pro wrestling could be. They weren't fucking constantly breaking furniture nobody was doing goddamn somersaults and flips they were in shape believable guys hitting each other hard in safe places acting like it's a struggle roddy's cardio is incredible he's in tremendous shape he wasn't blessed with size but he's strong as a bull and he he works the way that he should for his size and gimmick and Joe the same way. He's believable because he's a fucking beast. And he can pull out a dive every now and then. And it looks like a goddamn flying greyhound. But he will beat you and pummel you down. And he's a got a mean countenance when he does it. And, and that is what I wished that instead of this silly joke crowd, the buckaroos and their ilk, that the passion of these guys could have been looked kindly on by a gullible billionaire 
so that you could have modern style, athletic, competitive, serious pro wrestling that people could enjoy instead of a bunch of goddamn silliness from the fucking Ringling Brothers set. Their chops and forearms landed. They weren't standing there daring the other guy to take a free shot. They were trying to avoid him, which is what you would do. Aggression. Uh, you know, Roddy sells and fights from underneath. Well, Joe is a very formidable looking guy. He moves his fucking weight around. A punk was good on color. He mentioned he has never beaten Samoa Joe, which is important to say. And he's he's named Brian, the fans of Collision, we're the colliders out there. For all the colliders out in the audience. Yeah, I don't know about that one. Um <laughs> but anyway, they went back and forth, Roddy and, and Joe, and uh, again, two really good workers doing what they do. And finally, Roddy had built, he had tried to get some kind of backbreaker for a while and he couldn't pick Joe up, but finally he hit a backbreaker, but he sold his own knee. And then he hit a kick and got a two count. They go back and forth again, and Roddy gets an angle slam on the big son of a bitch for a two count. But then, boom, just seconds later, Joe maneuvers behind, gets the rear choke, and takes Roddy down, and he passed out. And the referee stopped it. There was no tap. I don't mind a heel using a sleeper or a choke or a submission hold, but I hate it when the fucking baby face taps should always either referee stop it or pass out. And again, it was a good solid match, and I bet you this kept the audience like the last week's. We don't have ratings yet. It's holiday. We may not have them for the drive through I don't know, but you wouldn't, if you wanted to, to watch a wrestling program, you would not have changed the channel on this match. You wanted to see what was going to happen. And then afterwards... Joe comes back in the ring and picks Roddy up and gives him a power slam on a chair in the ring. Just one, just once. And Punk rolls in and Joe leaves and they stayed with it. And this is the most important part. And there's a couple points to be made about this. But you saw the EMTs putting the neck brace and on Roddy and putting him on the backboard. And I wrote, amazing, it's like a wrestling show. And then they, they showed them wheeling Roddy out on the stretcher after a power slam on the chair. This show is not embarrassing to watch. This show, honestly, right now, as I'm going to mention, in a vacuum, would make you care and want to next week, well, how is Roddy? And goddamn, who's, who's going to do something about this? And is he still in the hospital or whatever the fuck? But here's the problem, not only with the, I talked about the girls' ladder matches, how can the fucking 250-pound guys get hurt taking a bump that the 120-pound girls get up from, but this is how it's supposed to be done. A guy was power slammed by a 300-pound fucking heel on a goddamn metal folding chair. He should go to the hospital and get checked out. We should have EMTs, and there should be drama. But the problem is, when these little hatchet-headed, nitwit college dropouts wearing their flowery fucking skinny jeans come off the goddamn roof through three flaming tables and pop up to take a selfie with their opponent immediately afterwards, it kind of dulls the response of the fans to when somebody tries to do it right. Which is why I've always said that all that shit not only irresponsible for your health and the longevity of your career, but also, even if it's some wrestler, I don't give a fuck whether he lives, dies, turns blue, or drops dead. It's bad for the business because you're limiting what you can do to get a rise out of people and get a sympathy on somebody that's been injured. When you've proven to them time after time that none of this shit can possibly hurt you even when much of it does what do you think brian i thought it was a good match i think if you want to talk about sports-based wrestling samoa joe and roddy strong are two of the guys that exemplify that roddy strong's not a big guy and next to samoa joe joe looked massive yeah by twice the size of him but he's an athlete and he works that style really well really good match 
I'm not as bothered by the tap out finish. Although I think you have a great point. Uh, the post-match post-match was good. It was serious. It was a great way to go off the air, leaving you intrigued for next time. I thought Punk's acting was a little better than Adam Cole's. Maybe this is why I'm so accepting of buddy film Adam Cole right now with MJF, because I like it better than the dramatic Adam Cole. I've seen too much of that recently. You're okay, Roddy. You're okay, Roddy. You'll be all right, pal. Yeah, that was too much for me. Uh, beyond that, Punk was really good on commentary. Besides that, a, f- a friend like that, I just got run over by a fucking locomotive. You'll be all right, pal. You're okay. Beyond that, though, Punk great on commentary, and they've done a good job of building up the anticipation for Punk versus Joe, and you have to think it's going to be more than a one-time thing. That could be what this show needs, because right now, I think part of the problem, we don't know what the rating is, there's some real good talent on the show, there's only one star on the show. And that's not to take anything away from MJF, because I don't think he's going to be on the show every week. Jericho was on the show last week. He's not going to be on the show every week. Hopefully. It's all about CM Punk. But you need another star. Whether it's Samoa Joe, and it's obviously Samoa Joe is not at the level of star of CM Punk, but in terms of in-ring work and treating him like a credible star, you could do a lot with him. But they probably do need some more star power. Wednesday night needs the star power of CM Punk. And Saturday night needs more than just the star power of CM Punk. I agree with you there. And one more thing, we make the comment now. Wonder what is in that belt bag that Punk has carrying around? Because it seems to me odd that if it was the AEW world title belt that he never lost, that he would have pulled it out and showed it by now. What do you think? It's the spinner belt, the old WWE spinner belt that he has I know there's, there? maybe there's something going on or maybe now that i've said that that will plant a seed and there will be something going on maybe a snake maybe Jake but it just gave him a bag with a snake in it well i don't know it, it it's not moving so i don't think it's alive but it seems odd that he wouldn't pull it right out right and say i well, never lost this well that's how vince got in trouble by pulling it out and saying i never lost this maybe it's his laundry maybe it's his laundry in the bag well no vince vince got in trouble just because he pulled it out and hit it several times not because he ever lost it anyway 